Get ready. Mike Tirico is about to pull you in to discuss his life on the road with NBC Sports. Looking deep. Chris Fink down there. Fink, did he catch it? Yes! Touchdown Irish! Incredible grab! Mike's got you covered for the PGA Tour, the Triple Crown, Notre Dame football, and football night in America. You can't cover all of these things. It's the Mike Tirico Podcast. This marks the beginning of a new broadcast era. Mike Tirico, Godspeed. We thank you for downloading the podcast. Glad you are with us for episode four, which is with a good friend, Al Michaels. We'll talk everything from Howard Cosell to hockey to Sunday night to Monday night to Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady to uh, what Al still enjoys about the job. It's all coming up here in a minute with our friend Al Michaels. And then after that, I'm going to share a thought or two with you on the college football playoffs. As you know, on Tuesday, the first set of rankings came out. I want to discuss what they mean and an experience I had a few weeks ago which uh, gave me more insight into that. So that's on the back end. But first, we begin with Mr. Sunday Night Football. Okay, so I love uh, Al Michaels' book, by the way. If you love Al and TV and sports and all that good stuff, it's as good a read as you can uh, have. It's a few years old. You can't make this up as the title, which you hear Al say often enough, and it's so true. I'm just going to read the first paragraph because it's my favorite paragraph of a jacket of a book. No sportscaster has covered more major sporting events than Al Michaels during his 40-plus year career. He's logged more hours on live primetime network TV than anyone in history. And then it goes on to say everything Al's done, which most of you know. But when you think about that, 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 that is a pretty cool line for somebody's uh, career to wrap up uh, the cover of their book. Al, do you still love it as much as you did whenever you got started with the primetime run back in the 70s? I guess, Mike, you know, the, the deal is you can't get rid of me. You know, I'm still here, still doing all these things. You know, in a way, Mike, I think uh, I'm enjoying it at least as much as ever and probably more. And I liken it to guys like uh, Tom Brady and Drew Brees, who we'll have on Sunday Night Football this week. And I think as you get older and, you know, the end of the career is certainly a lot closer than the beginning I think there's an understanding and maybe there's a maturity involved and you begin to savor it more than ever. And I know when, you know, when you, you're in this business and you start your career, you're wondering, you know, how far can it go? How long can it last? And I've been very lucky in, in both instances. And so right now I'm kind of just relishing everything. And when we get a game like we had a couple of weeks ago, oh. in Foxborough between the Chiefs and the Patriots, I mean, that's, that's as much fun as you can have, and all these great events that I've been uh, uh, lucky to be a part of through the years, uh, you just you add another one, and it doesn't ever become old hat, Mike. It becomes uh, something that you know is fresh and new, and 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 um, it's the kind of situation where you want it to happen every week. You know it can't, but when it does, you want to uh, fully embrace it and, and savor every moment. And I want to talk football with you a little bit because so often you're doing the game and you're setting up Chris and Michelle and just making the broadcast work so well. But uh, just just knowing from sitting in that chair and from watching and listening to you and talking with you about this over the years, you know, we, we, we get a sense of football that you don't necessarily have the runway to express very often. I thought you said something really fascinating, Al, as I'm watching the end of that New England-Kansas uh, City game. And Mahomes was terrific in that game. You pointed out that the week before, we had a defensive struggle with Houston and Dallas. And the next week, you had this shootout, 43-40, coming down to the end of the game. And both were really exhilarating and fun. And it feels like Dallas-Houston was a throwback to what used to be a great game, like in the old Giants and 49ers days. And this is the modern great game, 43-40. Look at the score of last year's Super Bowl. And it's fun to be a part of the evolution of the way offenses are putting up points. I'm just curious what you see as you've watched pro football evolve here to a different place over the last three or four years. Yeah, it is different, and, and it is evolving. And, you know, the great thing about a Dallas-Houston game, which went to overtime and was uh, hard-hitting and uh, – and dramatic and exciting in a different way than a 43-40 to 40 game is. Um, I, I, the great thing about a game like that is that it shows you that even though there's this, you know, there's been uh, this explosion of, of offense and points, and I think 48 points per game versus 44 last year uh, in the National Football League this season is, is has become the norm, that you can still go back to, 
I guess, you know, when we say the old days, Mike, you know, the old days used to mean like 1940. Now the old days may mean like, you know, 2013. I don't know exactly. what it mean anymore. <laughs> but it, it's, it's great to know that every game is not the same, that every game won't necessarily bring to you 50 to 60 points, uh, but you can have one of those, uh, and I hesitate to call it throwback games, but it's just that the defense took over that night. Uh, I don't know whether, you know, you, you could make a case and people could say, well, the offenses were inept. I don't think that was the case. I think it just happened to be a night when the, the, the defenses were a lot better than the offenses. And by the way, in that game, you still had some, you know, fantastic plays on the offensive oh, side. Yeah. The DeAndre Hopkins uh, uh, catch and run and spinning the spinorama in overtime was, was fantastic. I mean, that looked like a video game. So. That's why, you know, Mike, you and I share so, so many uh, common traits in terms of our, what, we, what we love about sports. And what I love about sports is the drama uh, and the unpredictability. And there's nothing better what people, you know, some people think, oh, announcers root. We, you know, yeah, we root. We don't root for teams. We root for drama. Right. Closeness. And, and, and to me, you know, in, in the number of all the Super Bowls I've been able to do, uh, I've been able to... Uh, to, to savor every one, but then you, you know, as you're driving to the stadium, you're going, hey, we only get this every three years, so we don't want to blow out. And I've done ten of them, and fortunately, six of them have gone to the very, very, very end. One was, you know, a, an interesting game in uh, in Detroit back in '05, Pittsburgh and Seattle, which was okay, wasn't great. Right. And then I've had three monster blowouts. So you know, that's that's not fun. What's fun is, you know, if the game. Ends on the last play of the game, as the last Super Bowl did, or if it goes to overtime. And I know the only time I've ever really been jealous in my (laughs) career was when Atlanta and New England went to overtime, and I'm sitting there uh, uh, watching the game at home and going, no, 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 it's 28-3. to This can't be the game that I want. It can't be the overtime game, and it was. But uh, I'll live with it. <laughs> and Joe and Joe and Troy got that game. I I remember right. sitting in the stands thinking the same thing. Man, you wish it was ours. I always tell people, Al, look, I, I truly don't care who wins because, as we know, we've been around this long enough. It doesn't change our lives. It doesn't change the fans' lives. Thank goodness they're so emotionally involved that they feel like right. it does. But I always say I want the ball in the air, the clock to say zero. And wherever it comes down determines who wins or loses. Then you know that your week of preparation wasn't for naught, that it was all worth it, and you got to share with everyone a really great game. I I couldn't agree more. And I know that this sounds crazy, but there are times when I will go back to the hotel after the game, and you know the way it is. When we're doing a game, we're we're doing our game inside the game. We're doing our television production game. And we have so many things to think about. And I know there have been a couple of instances when I've gotten in an elevator at the hotel, you know, an hour after the game, and, and somebody will come in and, and go, hey, who, who won the game tonight? And I actually have to think about it. I have to think about who won the game. Because we're so immersed in how we're doing the game and what's, what the, you know, how we're folding in you know, all of our elements inside the game. So you, you really need to, to, to take a second and go, well, wait a second. Who played and who won? It's so funny. I, I've I've done the same thing over and over that I actually now when I leave the stadium, leave the booth, I try to look back at the scoreboard to remember the score because I can't spit the score back of the game I just called for three and a half hours. And you go, well, what happened? But you're right. That that does explain it so well. You, you mentioned uh, you know watching the Super Bowl back then and, and watching games. I, I, I'm I'm curious. I'm sure the listeners would be curious. As you watch a game, can you? divorce yourself from the television production of the game and just simply enjoy, especially a football game? It's hard. Uh, I know early on in the game, probably not. I'm looking to see, you know, uh, what the produ- – I'm not, I'm not looking necessarily, but, I mean, being in the business, you, right. you can't help but think about, you know, how the, that uh, production is being constructed. But I will say that, you know, if, if a, a great game in baseball goes to the ninth inning or the NBA goes to the last minute or so or – I'm watching a football game. Yeah, I, then I can kind of forget about how they're doing the game and really get involved with, you know, what's, what's happening on the field or on the ice or on the court or whatever. So, it, but it, it takes that long. Apart from that, when you're watching like an entire telecast, you're really you're watching the game, but you're also watching the production and how the game is being constructed on television. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. What, what I've loved and for the last two years uh, before this season – 
the chance to do the uh, on-site hosting role of Football Night in America meant I got a chance to hang out with Alan Chris all weekend and Michelle and Fred Gadelli and Drew Esikoff and the rest of this great Sunday night team. And it was a blast because you get to do dinner, hang out, conversations back and forth to the stadium. And w- one of the things that uh, reminded me and really helped me reconnect with my love of going to games and being uh, involved in sports is remaining a sports fan. You, the, one of the first things you would talk about in November is how the L.A. Kings were doing. <laughs> or watching a Dodger game in the summer or, 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 the, or early in the season. And that, um, that fandom, I think, is so important for all of us to have. So we keep connected with our customers so uh, we can keep talking to them. What, what are the sports that you sit down as a fan and just really enjoy watching a game now? Well, you know what? A, a huge hockey fan I am. And we've had King season tickets for a long, long time. I think 26 or 27 years now. Wow. And the thing about, and I actually in the introduction in my book, in the first you know, part of the book, I talked about the great thing about you know being in this business is that one of the reasons that I got into it anyway, and I'm sure you did too. You loved it. You loved it as a kid. Yes. And you go to games, and and now you're part of the business. But I, I can still, and since I, I don't do hockey, I can go to a Kings game and just be a fan and watch the games. And I mean. I'm not talking about my Kings right now. We're not doing very well. <laughs> but I will say, you know, for me as a fan, it was phenomenal. I mean, going to Kings games all of those years, they weren't very good. They rarely got even into the playoffs. And if they did, they were out in a heartbeat, uh, except, you know, going back to the Gretzky years. That was different. But that was a, a long, long time ago. And I know that out of nowhere, when the Kings won the Stanley Cup in 2012, I mean, it gave me chills just being a fan, just watching this, and then they do it again in 2014. So I know my wife and I, and you know, and my, and my son, who you know has been watching hockey since he was, uh, you know, six, seven years old, and loves it and goes to every game. You know, we would always walk out of the building and go, you know, why can't we ever be the Red Wings? Why? Why, why do we have to be so mediocre and bad all of these years? And then all of a sudden, it morphed into. The Stanley Cup is being skated around Staples Center. What? How did this happen? Where did this come from? What did we did? We became the Red Wings. What happened? So, you know, that's the wonderful thing about sports. Yes. You know, Mike, there's an ebb and a flow. And, you know, just the L.A. Kings is an example. Not good for a lot of years. We used to go to the games all the time because we loved the sport. The sport was so good. And then, you know, you win two Stanley Cups in three years, and now you're kind of back to not where you necessarily were, but you know now it's uh, they'd be a long shot to you know to get there again. But that's the great thing about sports. You just don't know what's going to happen. You, you love investing. I I loved going to the Tigers games in Detroit. The season that that they had the worst record in baseball came within a loss of the all time loss record. It made so much sweeter watching them win the pennant, and go to the World Series right. a couple of years after that. And you sit and you watch Justin Verlander pitch in the World Series last year, or J D Martinez play for the Red Sox in this year's World Series. And you go. They were ours. What happened? <laughs> why, why can't they be big? It's, it, it is the, the joy of sports. You've had, and, and I think you're a big reason for their success, but you've had um, some of the best partners to work with. Go back to Jim Palmer and Tim McCarver in baseball and obviously John Madden and Collinsworth and, and all, all the way back through your career. What makes, Al, a really good partnership in a booth on the air? Well, I think number one, uh, the the analyst. And since I've always obviously been the play-by-play uh, person, uh, you have to have an analyst who not only works hard but understands the essence of television. And then, I mean, once they do that, and then you know you've got you know you you've hit gold. I mean, I, look, I had John Madden for seven years, who who kind of created the template that exists right now, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and has spawned a number of you know. Imitators. I have Chris Collinsworth, who's as good as it's ever gotten. And you're right, I had, I had Jim Palmer, I had Tim McCarver. One of the things that all of these guys had in common was um, an understanding of the art of communication. You can find anybody who's retired, any coach, any player, or, or any executive, whatever. Bring them to the booth. Of course, they have knowledge. They understand a lot about what you know. Maybe the average viewer wouldn't understand, but if you can't communicate it uh, in the correct way, then it just becomes noise to the, the viewer. And especially in a day in a, in a day and age like we're in right now, Mike, there are so many games. So what separates the really good guys from everybody else? 
and that's the fact that they, they get television. They understand right. what television is about. They understand how to communicate. And the great partners, in, in addition to that, I mean, I've been so lucky that these guys have all become like great friends through the years. Mm. So there's a chemistry, mm. there's a bonding, there's an understanding. They don't have to be, you know, it's like having a great friend. They don't have to be in the business, but when they're in the business, they're, they're sitting with you, uh, next to you in the booth, and they become like great pals. There's nothing better than that. Because here you are, you've got a great uh, relationship on the air and a great relationship off the air. And so for me, I mean, I really, I've struck gold in that area through the years. You go all the way back to even, you know, I was doing Olympic hockey in 80, 84, and 88, and my partner was Ken Dryden. Right. And Ken, the great Montreal goalie, Hall of Famer, you know, uh, won several Stanley Cups with Montreal, the Vezina Trophy. And, and the great thing about a guy like Ken was when he got, you know, the first time he was ever on television was the 1980 Olympics. And, of <laughs> course, that led to the, the miracle on ice and, and all that happened in Lake Placid. But Ken immersed himself in how and how to do this. He understood hockey. He understood strategy. He, uh, he had uh, great respect amongst the, all of the, the people involved with hockey, and including Herb Brooks, the coach. But he wanted to know how, the, how television worked. Mm. And I'll never forget one of the great conversations I ever had is Kenny and I uh, met in Moscow uh, in late 1979. There's a tournament called the Izvestia Tournament, oh, yeah. oh. Uh, which features, <laughs> features all of the, it featured all of the great uh, 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 hockey teams from around the world who would be in the Olympics. Oddly enough, the only team that wasn't in that tournament was the U.S. team, but we got to see them uh, separately leading up to Lake Placid. So we're there, and when Kenny and I meet uh, the night before the tournament starts, and we have dinner in the hotel in Moscow. And we start to talk about the difference between um, international hockey and the National Hockey League. Right. And Ken, uh, who you know could have been Prime Minister of Canada if he wanted, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. guy. Oh. oh, brilliant guy! And his book, The Game, is off the charts, phenomenal. Yes. So Ken is sitting there, and uh, he describes uh, over like a three-minute period to me uh, the difference between the the two uh, disciplines of hockey. And then he says to me, do you think this is the type of thing that would interest the viewer? Hmm. And I said, absolutely. But, Ken, here's what you have to do. Can you get it down to eight seconds? <laughs> so I, he, I said, yeah, this is great. But, Ken, this is not talk radio. So, and he laughed. And, but he, he figured out a way to blend in what he wanted to say in a very short period of time and very concisely. So guys like that who want to be great, and McCarver was sensational at this, mm. doing baseball with him, and, and John Madden and Chris Collins were to this day, they understand television, they understand communication, they're great guys, and that's a home run for everybody. And, and you've you've made all of them uh, you've made all of them shine. It, it's it's really a, it, it's a lesson that all of us who do this have seen that that you can make your partners better by playing to their strengths, and like you said. Hanging out and it, it, it becomes you can hear it on the air that this was the conversation at dinner last night or two nights ago. Howard Cosell is uh, obviously always uh, a name that comes up when people talk to you because of your time working with Howard. Your invitation of Howard is all time great. Would Howard enjoy the media landscape, in your opinion, that we have right now if he was here? No, not at all. I mean, Howard Howard would thumb his nose at, at just about everything. Uh, he would hate social media. He would hate talk radio, the way we know it. Uh, he, he would just think it was, I mean, if I had to figure out a, a phrase that Howard might use to describe wh where we are today in, in the sports media landscape, and not all of it, but some of it, sure. uh, he would describe it as a cacophony of crap. This is what, you know, <laughs> I knew Howard very, very well. I worked a lot of games with him, and, and this is what, what Howard would say. So, um <laughs> Howard was as complicated and interesting and fascinating a human being as I've ever worked with. Very different on every level. Uh, there was nobody like him when he was uh, on the air, and, and he would engender a lot of, you know, um, um, hate, really. Mm -hmm. People would hate him. Some people would love him. And then you look back, and I know in, in today's world, I find it fascinating to hear somebody who's, uh, you know, 35 or 40 years old talking about, oh, there'll never be another Howard Cosell. I'm thinking, how would you know? 
<laughs> I mean, what right. are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a great point. So there, there, there's a, a little bit of gilding the lily, Mike, in terms yep. of Howard's legacy. But Howard's legacy is basically he was as different as it came. Uh, he had the backing of Rune Arledge, who was running ABC Sports at the time. Uh, he could do things that nobody else could do. Uh, and, and now, you see, what, what's happened now is, and I mentioned that, you know, John Madden has spawned a lot of imitators because of his style, you know, and the sound effects that he used. And so, right. and Howard has two to a degree. So you, you, you hear so many people these days who have to have a, a hot take on everything. Really? Does everything require a hot take? I don't think so. Uh, I love, you know, certain hot takes as much as anybody, and I love when something's really interesting. But to fill out, you know, a three- or four-hour show with everything is, everything is like black or white and there's never any gray in it? Come on. It's, it's not the way the world operates, but it's kind of the way the media landscape is these days. Yeah, no doubt. Two, two questions to get you out of here with. The, the sports gambling issue has become more prevalent as states now make it legal. You've always had fun with it with a little wink. It, it's even less of a wink now because you can, it, it's an honest conversation. Do you see a day here down the road that it will become a significant, significance is the wrong word, a legitimate part of the conversation within a sports broadcast? I, I think it's on its way to becoming uh, that, Mike. I'm not sure the, the ultimate manifestation of it. I don't know where that goes. Uh, but clearly, uh, this is going to become more relevant. And, and look, when the league or leagues say, you know, we really don't want point spreads or over-unders mentioned and all of the rest, and yet they're trying to get their piece of the, the gambling pie. Now, hold right. on a second. <laughs> right. I mean, what are we talking about here? I mean, that's the ultimate in hypocrisy. You want to be a part of it, but you don't want your broadcast partners to start talking about it? Well, you know, hold your horses on that ca- in that case, Mike. So I'm not sure. You know, look, to me, I've always had, I've always had fun with it. I had fun with it in the Kansas City. Oh, it's the best. Game. Because, I mean, the old, look... I, people who were watching the game at that point, not everybody, but a lot of the audience, they, they have a, a vested interest in this. Know so your audience. Me. Know your audience is one of the know definitive things of our job. And at that Correct. point, the people who are hanging on every snap are those yeah. people. Yeah, but Mike, you know, the other night, so, you know, half the crowd had started to go home. They were very happy, of course, but it's 45 to 10. And so now the, the over-under in the game is 56 and a half. The 55 points have been scored. We're not saying this at this point. Right. But what happened was, so, you know, Andy, so now it's fourth down and four for Kansas City, I don't know, three and a half, four minutes, whatever it is. Right. And you're still under. And then, so what, what was Andy Reid going to do at that point? Was he going to kick a field goal, which would have put him up, whatever. So it looked for a second as if the field goal team was coming out, and then they stopped. And then I heard this murmuring in the crowd, like, you know, oh. And so this was more than just, hey, we want it, we want another, whatever it was. You knew that a lot of the people who were moaning, groaning, clap, whatever they were doing, there was a reaction in the crowd, which got me, of course, to, I hadn't been thinking about the 56 and a half at that point, but I'm thinking about, well, wait a minute, what's that murmuring about? And then I go, aha, I know exactly what that murmuring's about. So that's when I, you know, I'm playing the game. I'm being a little bit of the rascal that I've always been. <laughs> I'm, I'm coming in the side door, the back door, whatever yes. door you're coming into. And it's almost like I think it was, it, it was more fun uh, in the old days. When I would do this and still do it, there's a perception that people had of announcers aren't supposed to do this. Right. But, right. you know, Brent Musburg has been doing it for years. Brent's been, you know, he's been my partner in crime on this stuff. Yes. Other guys have done it. Chris Fowler did it in, in, within a play call in a college game a few years ago. I'm hearing it all over the place. Joe we- Buck is doing it. So we're all kind of doing this stuff. And I think it was more fun than if somebody said, okay, uh, every, nothing is barred anymore. Go for the goal. It's, it's true. more fun being a little bit of the rascal <laughs> on the back end. You take Scott Van Pelt's um, uh, uh, bad beats. It's, right. it's fantastic. That's the kind of thing I'd love to do on television. We, we're not there yet, Mike, but maybe someday. It, it's but we've we've all learned from you and Brent. There's no no doubt about uh-huh. it. You guys you guys set the bar for all of us. Lastly, uh, Sunday night coming up here. 
it's Brady against Rodgers. When you get two guys like that more than ever, Al, it's an appreciation for those quarterbacks on other sides in separate conferences who only meet every four years. Th- those are really the, the special nights on the Sunday night package, but in, in the NFL in general. What, what are those nights like for you, for guys we've seen play quarterback uh, virtually every game here over the last decade or so? Mike, number, number one, when the schedule came out, and, you know, I'm going down the list, and we see that. Uh, everybody on the crew, we go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. That's the game we wanted, no question. So right off the bat, that was the spotlight game, and you, you knew it would be special. And, and you, you, you couldn't wait for it. And the irony about this game is, when you know, we're doing the opening a Sunday night game in, in Green Bay against Chicago. Right. And Rodgers is carted off. Right. And Chris and I looked at each other in the booth, and we, if, uh, you know, if, if we had like a, a cartoon bubble, and our thoughts would have been, we can't believe we're going to flex out of Green Bay, New England. We thought, you know, Rodgers right. was done for the year at that point. So we're thinking, oh, we, this can't be. And then, of course, Aaron comes back, you know, the heroic return, wins the game. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's great. So it's, it's uh, thrilling to have, you know, Aaron back. Brady's always great, obviously, the you know, best of all time. Uh, it's one of those things, and, and, and the New Orleans-Minnesota game, same thing. When that game ended last year, yep. I'm on the phone with Fred. We're going, hey, they're meeting next year. we got to get that game, and we got that game too. <laughs> so, I mean, back-to-back, you got these games that are fantastic, and, and you know, you don't know how they're going to shake out, but at least, boy, you've got a pretty good storyline going in, Mike. It, they're awesome. They're awesome. Uh, hit them straight, as you always do, I'm sure. Uh, it, it is, is, right. uh, is great to catch up. I, I miss the dinners on the road. I look forward to uh, seeing you during the playoffs, pal. All right. Well, we'll, we'll send you some takeout from Manny. <laughs> Please do Be in good. Minnesota. Thanks, Al. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mike. My thanks to Al Michaels. Always great to talk sports with a friend, but also one of the best of all time. Now, as promised, a thought here and a brief one on the college football playoff. We saw the rankings come out and all the machinations. I had the opportunity to go at the beginning of October to Dallas, Dallas area, Grapevine, Texas specifically, and sit in the exact same room where they go and do the deliberations for the college football playoff. They've done this mock selection multiple times each year they do it with members of conferences they do it with media members espn which carries the water for the playoff as the rights holder their broadcasters have most all been through it i had the opportunity to go one because i'm a huge college football nerd two i've got friends who are involved in the process with the cfp and my thanks to them for doing it and three with notre dame now involved in the mix here calling the notre dame games on nbc it was good to have a little bit more background what i learned from the mock experience is this it does change every week. They are charged to go in there with a blank slate every week. They do as good a job, I think, as possible in trying to find whatever that sweet spot is between the metrics and that, quote, eye test. There are enough people on the football of the football world on that committee to be able to ask those questions. The push-pull is, and this is a lot of what college football is, It's very subjective. It's very hard to separate these teams. So the process is imperfect. I still say that they made a mistake when they started by picking four teams because there are five major conferences and Notre Dame as stakeholders in all of this. Why would you only split the profit four ways? And what if this year two teams from the SEC get in and Notre Dame is undefeated and one other conference champ? That keeps three agreed parties who will have their constituents with no seat at the table for the final four i think they should go to eight each conference champion goes which makes those conference championships great the sixth spot goes to the best team from that group of six conferences as long as that team's in the top dozen nationally and the other two spots are four at large could be two more sec teams it would be the best way to do it do the quarterfinals on campus sites semifinals finals and so on that's been told by other people. I've said that for about five years. I'm going to continue on with that. I just want to make one last point on the poll. As these rankings come out, remember this. There's a lot of, oh, who's going to be two? Who's going to be three? Two and three doesn't matter a lick. One, the top team, goes to the bowl that is most convenient for them, their best turnout. You can make arguments either way that Alabama would be better served in Uh, Jerry World, the Cotton Bowl, or the Orange Bowl. I think the Cotton Bowl would be their better fit. In either case, whatever that argument is, that's where Alabama goes. Two and three go to the other place. They take care of one because they feel like they've earned it. Two and three will go to the other spot no matter what. And all the differences between two and three 
is laundry. What jersey are you going to wear? Are you going to wear the road jersey or the home jersey? That's the only difference with two and three. So anytime somebody starts a debate of who's two, three should be two, two should be three, turn it off. Because it doesn't matter, and they start fresh every single week. Just a little background that we got on the college football playoff process for those of you who like the college game as well. We thank Alex Hardy, as always, for his help. We thank you for downloading. And we're back with you next week with another great edition, we hope, of the podcast. Mike Tirico, thanks for the download. Have a great weekend.